stand and clap as we sing our first song, This Is The Day. Christian Church, and got a few announcements here. I've got one from Cindy Bailey that she posted about Clint this morning. He was crushed by a 900-pound bull earlier this week. Currently, they know that he has a broken collarbone in two places, bro multiple broken ribs, a separated aorta, and a punctured lung. He is on a ventilator because of the punctured lung. It's too rough for him to breathe but the doctors are saying that he's doing well so and then Scott Henry still needs to be on our prayers I know that they said that he's got a hole in his heart and they were having some issues with the insurance trying to get him to a I guess a step down unit or something of that sort so and the flowers are left over from Chuck Petoska's funeral um, February 18th, they have dominoes. Crystal Turner's mom is feeling ill this morning, so you may lift her up. Kelly and Kay, the, our youth minister, he, him and his wife both have COVID. So does anybody else have any announcements? Who's got the mic? Uh, I'm working with a group. Ooh, do I can't see. Uh, I'm working with a group out of Kingfisher County that is trying to help 65-year-olds and older get their set of vaccine shots. Um, we're compiling a list uh, now. I have to turn that in by 11 o'clock tomorrow. Um, we'll set up a clinic in Kingfisher where that's where you'll go to take your shot and we'll set up a second shot appointment for you before you leave. So just to make that a little bit easier for our um, people that can't get on that computer and uh, sit there and trying to get them a, uh, an appointment. So uh, if you know of somebody um, that would be interested in that, um, see me after church, I just need a name and a phone number. And that way we'll give them a call and if they choose not to when we call, that'll be fine. But just to get them on that list to start with is uh, the goal for this this group of people. So if you've got a name and a number and you're interested in, let me know. If you need to uh, call me later, um, I'll uh, visit with you after church and get, you, get some numbers for you to give me a call with. Good morning. We're going to try something this morning in the more traditional style of our communion. Our deacons, after the, uh, I, the uh, emblems are blessed, will come around with a tray and hand you individual cups. At that time, you take the communion, and then another deacon will come along with an empty tray for you to put the, tra the, uh, the empty cups in, too. They're going to pass them directly to you wearing a glove, so please resist the urge to grab the tray. <clears throat> we hope this will work and give it a little more traditional feel. So we'll see how it goes. Thank you.
want to thank the church mouse for my birthday card. <laughs> you missed Antoine. If the roads are good in the morning, I am supposed to go and have some testing on my heart, and then I'll see the heart doctor tomorrow afternoon. So I would like prayers, please. Okay, that looks like that's it. I also forgot one that they are looking at doing a fundraiser for the youth group, maybe possibly smoking some meat for Easter weekend, but there will be more details to come with that as they become available. Can we go to the Lord's house with prayer? I just want to lift up all these prayer requests as we always have a need in this church that we lift up Kay for her procedures that's going to be done. Scott and Clint and Kelly with all... There are issues that are going on. I just ask that you guys join me in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen.
In important ways, money is power. God has more power than anyone. He shares it with us freely so that we can experience this wild and interesting life with him. Part of that life is the life of the church, and to be vital in communion with God and in alignment with his mission, we care for our members and our community. I ask that you would give that care now so that God's power can flow through us.
I'm saying I guess I don't have one. Said I've never been to church before in my life. By the time the evening had ended, I'm going to accept the seat of Christ as the Savior. And the young lady suggested that he could further his Christian walk. He should start reading the Bible and find a church to attend. So Tom said, my grandmother had the Bible I can read. Said I can uh, have a church right around the corner from my house. And a lot of people go there. Said I'll, I'll try to go there. So Sunday morning, he decided to go to church. <coughs> As he uh, entered the front door, he found out he was a little late. There were congregations already stand, standing and they were singing a song. And he looked for a place to join in, but... It, it was pretty well packed, so as he made his way down the aisle, he was looking for a place to settle in, but couldn't find one, and the people were looking at him. You know, Tom was new on the inside, but he was the same on the outside. Had his blue jeans on and his t-shirt and his sandals. <laughs> So, by the time the song had ended, he was at the front of the church, and everybody sat down, and he was left standing right in front of everybody, and, and he decided just to go over here to the side and sit down on the carpet and enjoy the service. What he didn't know was there was an old Deacon Jones was trying to catch up with them to help him find a place to sit, but here... Tom had already found his place to sit, so the congregation and the preacher were wondering what in the world is Deacon Jones going to do with this young man. And when Deacon got over to the young man, he laid his Bible on the floor and sat down right there beside him, put out his hand to, to welcome him. And that's what happened with Deacon Jones. The preacher got up a little while later and he said, I have a sermon prepared for you, but half of you won't remember what I said. But Deacon Jones gave us a lesson that each one of you will probably remember for a long time. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul wrote, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, <coughs> urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, <clears throat> with patience, bearing with one another in love. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, our God has every reason not to treat us with love like he does, because we're Without the death of Jesus Christ, we are not worthy. And the Bible also says that God is love. And as Christians, we are to share this love with everyone we meet. As you take part in communion this morning, I'd like you to think about, are you part of a judgmental congregation? Or are you... A good old Deacon Jones.
took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all you do for us. We thank you for your plan of salvation, your plan of forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the suffering you did on the cross for us. Most of all, we are thankful that you are with your Father in heaven and that someday you will come back and we will join you there. We ask that you will help us as we go through our lives, that we will live like you want us to. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How many of you woke up to cold weather this morning? <laughs> uh, cheer up, it's going to get worse. <laughs> uh, 
I don't think it was announced earlier, so let me remind you that next week we're planning to take up a special offering for the church in the Philippines. I'd like for you all to be preparing uh, your hearts and your wallet for that experience uh, next week. I'd like to announce that uh, I'm going to start preaching a series of sermons uh, beginning today through the book of 2 Timothy. You might ask, why 2 Timothy? Well, you remember at the uh, last of last year, we studied through the book of 1 Thessalonians, which was one of the first books that Paul wrote. 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote. And so it's kind of the bookends of uh, Paul's ministry. If you happen to have your little green sheet of uh, outline, you'll notice that there's very little printed on it today. Just a text and uh, then two words, Paul and Timothy. I'm going to try to profile Paul and Timothy before you this morning. Uh, you've heard of these names, particularly the Apostle Paul, all your life. So before we actually get into the book, I want to tell you a little bit about the man that wrote the book. And then I want to tell you a little bit about the man, the younger man, that received the book, uh, Timothy. And hopefully the Holy Spirit will speak to all of us uh, through this. Now the New Testament does not tell us very much about the physical appearance of the Apostle Paul. It says that he wore chains uh, some of the time when he was in prison. And it says, I bear in my body the scars, the marks of the Lord Jesus. So I thought just to begin, it might be interesting for me to go back into church history and to relate to you some of the physical characteristics that are recorded in non-New Testament sources about the person of the Apostle Paul. Uh, if you haven't heard this before, it uh, is somewhat quite interesting. There is a non-canonical book called The Acts of Paul, and it describes his physical appearance. It said, Paul was a man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs in a good state of body with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat hooked. And everybody said, Amen. <laughs> now, another uh, book, uh, The Acts of Paul and Thecla, added that he had a red, florid face. In the history of the contending of St. Paul, it says that his countenance was as ruddy as the ruddiness of the skin of the pomegranate. If you know anything about pomegranates, that helps you. If you don't, well, we'll go on. In the Acts of St. Peter, Peter, it confirms that Paul had a bald and shining head with red hair. Chrysostom records that Paul's stature was low, his body crooked, and his head bald. Lucian, in one of his writings, said that Paul was small, contracted, crooked, and about four feet, six inches tall. Literally, he said that Paul was three cubits tall. So Paul was about this tall. A very short man, bald hair, crooked nose, beady eyes, red complected, red hair, and bushy eyebrows. That's what he looks like. Uh, another fellow in Nicephorus claimed that Paul was a little man, crooked, and almost bent like a bow, with a pale countenance, long and wrinkled, and a bald head. Well, all of that to tell you that if you don't think you look very good, just know that God can use you because look what he did with Paul. Okay? And for all of you that feel like you are somewhat good looking, look how much more God is going to be able to use you than he used the Apostle Paul. Uh, evidently, Paul was not a person of uh, personal appeal, that is, in his presence. Uh, one fellow said he could write well, but he didn't look very good. <laughs> and uh, so be it. Why 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy was Paul's last written letter. It was written just days or months before 
He died by beheading under the persecutions of Nero, the emperor of Rome. According to church tradition, Paul was beheaded on the Ostian Way about three miles outside the city of Rome. Peter was approximately, it was approximately the same time of Peter's martyrdom. But Paul died by beheading, whereas Peter died by crucifixion. But Peter said he didn't feel like he was, that he deserved to be crucified like his Lord upright. So Peter requested that he be hung on a cross upside down and his grant was wished. His wish was granted. All of this happened about 35 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. But a lot has happened in the last 35 years. Oh, a lot has happened. You remember that Paul began as a persecutor of Christians, not as a believer. He was going to the city of Damascus to arrest Christians, men or women, and bring them bound in prison and perhaps to be killed for their faith. But on the road to Damascus, he saw a vision from heaven, a light shining from heaven, and he heard a voice saying, Fall, fall, why persecutest thou me, Jesus? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks and now arise and go into the city of Damascus and there it will be told you what you are to do. So Paul arose from from the road. He was blind. He was led by the hand into the city of Damascus. A few days later, a fellow named Ananias came and told him about Jesus and Peter and Paul believed that and then Paul was baptized and that began Paul's Christian journey. He became the largest, most prolific author of the New Testament. Thirteen of the books of the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul, maybe fourteen. Nobody knows for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. But God, through Paul, has spread the message of Jesus all over the entire civilized world. It began at Jerusalem and spread across the Roman Empire. In these last 35 years since the death of Jesus on the cross, Paul has traveled on three missionary journeys. Plus, he was, as a prisoner, sent to Rome, and he preached on the way. This is where the history of the book of Acts ends. We have a pretty good history of what happened to Paul on his arrival in Rome and his first prison, his first imprisonment in Rome. In that imprisonment, he was acquitted and he was released. And then Paul continued a ministry that we don't have a complete picture of. We just have bits and pieces from things that we pick up about him from the books that he wrote in this latter part of his life. His first imprisonment was a mild imprisonment. He wasn't in a dungeon. He was in a house with probably a guard standing outside the door. Uh, Paul could receive guests. He could entertain guests. Uh, he could write. Uh, he, uh, did not, he was not tortured. And eventually he was released. Upon being released from his first imprisonment, Paul again began journeying in ministry and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is from Eusebius. We can reconstruct reconstruct some of the history of Paul. He traveled to the island of Crete and he left Titus behind to set things in order and ordain elders in every city. Later on, he wrote the book of Titus uh, to the man of that name. And then Paul traveled to Ephesus and he left Timothy behind to pastor that church. And later he wrote 1 Timothy to give Timothy similar instructions to those he gave to Titus. And then he probably went on to Colossae because that is mentioned in the book of Philemon. And he said he intended to see Philemon when he was released from prison for he may have traveled to see Philemon. 
It says in 1 Timothy 1.3, he traveled through the regions of Macedonia, that is northern Greece. He told Titus that it was his intention to spend the winter in Nicopolis, a town on the western coast of Greece. And according to Romans chapter 15, verses 24 and 28, Paul intended to travel back to Rome and then go on to Spain. And in Spain, we don't know what happened, but we assume that Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ there. Clement of Rome, in his book in chapter 5, said that Paul preached the gospel to the extreme limit of the West. To the extreme limit of the West. Some people think that Italy was the extreme limit of the West. That would be his trip to Rome. But if Paul fulfilled his wish, the extreme limit of the West might be to Spain, to Gaul, and some people even think that Paul made it as far as Britain. That would have been the literal extreme limit of the West. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel in London before there was a London? Well, I didn't look up when the city of London was born. Maybe London was there when Paul preached there. But the point I'm trying to make is that Paul was busily occupied spreading the gospel of Jesus to the whole world and thus fulfilling Jesus' commission, go ye into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you and lo, I will be with you while you go even to the end of the world. Paul's passion was to spread the message of Jesus to every person. From that, we get this idea, that every person born on planet Earth should have at least one reasonable opportunity to hear about Jesus and receive him as their Savior. There should be no people on planet Earth that are born, live, and die without hearing about Jesus Christ. That's the message that we get from, from studying the life of the Apostle Paul. We are here on planet Earth in order to populate heaven with believers in Jesus Christ. We want heaven to be filled and hell to be as empty as possible. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the goal of the gospel. That's why Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Unfortunately, through 2,000 years of history, the church has sometimes suffered from institutional grift. We have drifted away from the primary meaning of the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to the all creation, to say other things that in themselves are good, but they are not essentially preaching the gospel, making people saved, and then planting churches. Somehow or another, we learn from the life of Paul that preaching the gospel to people who have never heard it is crucially important. It's at the heart of missions. It's at the heart of the gospel. And then these new believers are to be brought into a church. Everywhere Paul went, he established churches. And the books that we read that he wrote in the New Testament were written to the churches, which were the people that heard about Jesus from his ministry. This is the heartbeat of missions. It's the heartbeat of the church. It's why every church should have a missions program. And the missions program should be focused on telling people about Jesus Christ. Paul promised Timothy that he would come to visit him in Ephesus. And then from Ephesus, he went to the port city of Miletus, according to 2 Timothy 4.20. Then he went to Troas, because it says that in Troas he had to leave behind his coat and his books. We think that in Troas he was arrested again for the second time. This was an unexpected arrest. It was unprepared for. And he was sent to Rome for the second time for his second Roman imprisonment. This imprisonment was not mild. This imprisonment was harsh. He was put in prison in Rome, in a dungeon. Probably there was no light. There was no heat. 
It was damp. He was uncomfortable. He was in chains because he says, remember my chains. About this time, Nero, the mad emperor of Rome, was in charge. And Nero wanted to destroy and rebuild the city of Rome for his own personal glory. But he knew he couldn't do that on his own. And so, Rome, so Nero, emperor, set fire to the city of Rome so that it could be destroyed and he could reconstruct it. But he couldn't take the blame for that, and so Nero, according to tradition, blamed the Christians for the fires of Rome. It says that Nero played the violin while Rome burned. And that's where we get the old saying, fiddling while Rome burned. Nero blamed Christians for the fires in the city. But in reality, he set them himself. And so Nero started arresting Christians, putting them in prison. And we believe that this is why Paul was in prison for the second time. So here he is, an old man. Some suggest by this time he might have been as much as 80 years old, which in that day and age was a very old man in prison because he was a leader of a group of people suspected of burning the city of Rome, a group of people who, as rumor had it, met together every week to eat someone's flesh and drink their blood, who were considered to be a traitor to the government because they would not pray to the emperor who was God. Emperor worship. But Christians wouldn't do that. And so Paul was put in prison, in chains. He had no coat, because he said in 2 Timothy 4.13, when you come, bring the coat that I left with Carpus and Troas. He was cold, for it says in 2 Timothy 4.21, do your best to get here before winter. That's one of the poignant passages of Scripture. Come before winter. There's some things we do for Christ that must be done with urgency. They need to be done today because we can't guarantee that the opportunity will be here tomorrow. Paul, in prison, as an old man, writes to Timothy and he says, Come before winter. I'm cold. Come before winter because at any day, there may be a knock on my prison dungeon door and it's the executioner coming with the sword. If you don't get here quick, it may be too late. Come before winter. He had nothing to read, for it says in 2 Timothy 4.13, bring the scrolls, especially the parchments. He was lonely. Because it says in 2 Timothy 4.9-13, through 13, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, having loved the present world, has forsaken me. Christians have gone to Galatia. Titus went to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring Mark because he's helpful to me. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak and bring my scrolls, especially the parchment. Paul's preliminary hearing had already occurred. He had been found guilty, but not yet executed. He said, at my first defense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. But the Lord stood by my side. And the Lord was my strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So Paul writes this letter to Timothy. He has been found guilty. He's awaiting execution. You might say that 2 Timothy was written in the face of death and in the shadow of the sword. Paul has spent the second half of his life preaching the gospel of Jesus, establishing churches all over the known world, 
And now as he faces death, the great concern of his heart is what is going to happen to the churches that I have started after I'm gone. Who will watch over the churches then? Paul says, I can't be there any longer. I can't preach the gospel. I can't straighten things out. I can't set things in order. And so Paul says, there's dark shadows on the horizon. Already false doctrine is growing. Heresies are being promulgated. Churches are being led into things that are not another gospel. There's no gospel at all, Paul says. And the only thing he can do is hand the task of guarding the church to a young man named Timothy. He says, the time for my departure has come. I feel just a little, just a small fraction of the concern that Paul must have felt. After I'd been a minister for 17 and a half years in Eureka Springs, I felt like the time of my departure had come, not through death, not through martyrdom, but through retirement. I had invested almost 20 years, 17 and a half years in that church. And I know how I felt. I don't want the church that I gave 17 years to to just wither and die and blow away in the wind. I felt that pressure. And so having a good relationship with my elders, I went to my elders and got permission to go looking for my replacement. Found a guy named Mark Galloway. We brought him on board to be pastor under me. I introduced him to the church members, showed him some of the things that we were doing and how we were doing them. And eventually I got on my horse and rode off into the setting sun and Mark Galloway became the pastor in my stead and has done a good job. Church is doing well. That was the pressure that I felt for one small church. Paul was carrying this, a much greater pressure from a hundred churches 700, 1,000, I don't know. What's going to happen to the church when I'm gone? And his only choice, his only alternative, was to hand the baton to Timothy. Sometimes we have to hand the baton to the next generation. Just last week, or maybe it was week before last, I heard about a rancher farmer who started out early in his life raising wheat on a farm. Eventually he bought the farm. And then as his life continued, he, his enterprise grew and he bought other farms. So he had several farms. Then he had to buy the equipment required to run the farms. You know what those are, the tractors, the plows, the drills, the combines, the trucks. Then he bought the cattle and the livestock to put on the farm. Then he built his house on the farm where he lived. And he said, all my life I've accumulated all this. Now I'm getting old and I need to retire. And not a single one of my children have any interest in farming. They don't want any of the stuff that I've accumulated. They don't want the farm. They don't want to live in the house. They don't want to raise the wheat, take care of the cattle, run the equipment. He said, I don't know what to do. Can any of you relate to that? If that's what you feel about a farm, can you imagine what Paul felt for a thousand churches or so. So he wrote Second Timothy 
It's almost like Paul's last will and testament to the church. He just had one choice. Give it all to Timothy and only the Lord knows what will happen. That's Paul. Now let's look at Timothy. For over 15 years, Timothy has been Paul's faithful traveling companion. He was with Paul throughout most of the second and third missionary journeys. He was with Paul in the city of Jerusalem when he was arrested the first time. He traveled with Paul by sea on the first voyage to Rome. He was with Paul in Rome in the first imprisonment. Paul loved Timothy. Paul called Timothy his beloved and faithful child in the Lord. Timothy was Paul's fellow worker, Romans 16, 21. He was Paul's brother and God's servant in the gospel of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. Paul said in Philippians 2.20, I have no one else like him because as a son with his father, he has shared with me in the work of, work of the gospel. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to lead the church through difficult times, to combat heresy, to order the church's worship, to select and ordain elders, to oversee the, the church's widow program. But now, Timothy's largest role. Timothy, you have to take care of all these churches over the whole world. Preserve the faith. Carry the faith forward. Don't let anything happen to the gospel. Don't let anybody change it. That which we have received which you have heard. Give it to faithful men who will pass it on to others also, but don't change the gospel. Timothy, I'm giving this commission to you. Chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, guard the gospel. Chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, suffer for the gospel. Chapter 3, continue in the gospel. Chapter number 4, Proclaim the gospel. Yet, in many respects, Timothy, humanly speaking, was the wrong man. He had several deficiencies. Number one, he was young. Everybody say young. Paul was about 80 years old. People suspect that Timothy was maybe 35. A young man in that age. Not old enough to carry such heavy responsibility. Paul said to Timothy, don't let anybody despise your youth. A couple years later, Paul told Timothy, shun youthful passions. Timothy was too young for the job. So for all of you who have been asked to do something and you think you don't know enough and you're too young, this is for you. Number two, Timothy was prone to illness. He was not healthy. Paul mentions that Timothy had frequent illnesses, reoccurring illnesses. He told him, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. Now, I don't want any of you to take that and become an alcoholic because of that, okay? Um, but wine was medicinal. Timothy had stomach problems. He was prone to illness. Number three, he was an introvert. You know, some people are alphas and some are not. Some like to be in the limelight and some like to never be in the limelight. Some like to work from the front. Some like to work from the back. Timothy was shy. His natural ten temperament was to be timid. He had a tendency to shrink away from difficult tasks. Maybe he doesn't thrive speaking in front of crowds. Paul tells the church in, in Corinth regarding Timothy, if Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear. Be nice to him. Be nice to him. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace. 
it seems like Paul is always propping Timothy up because Timothy is not quite capable of standing on his own. Paul tells Timothy over and over, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. God's given us a spirit of confidence. You can almost hear Paul trying to tell Timothy, this is your job. Do it. Do it. By the way, this is a great encouragement for all of you who have been asked to do something at some point in your life and you don't feel like you can. Anybody? That you're the wrong person for the job, not qualified, not trained, not old enough, too old, whatever. Of all the people in the world that was to carry Paul's responsibility, Timothy seems to be the one that was least competent. But he was the best that Paul had. He was God's man. Somebody said it's not your ability, it's your availability that matters with God. Not how good you are, Phil, but are you available? And if you're available, God can work through you, you or you, whatever your issues are. At the time of Paul's martyrdom, the church was, humanly speaking, on the verge of annihilation. The state was against it. Christianity was an illegal religion. Its leaders were dying, heretics were arising, false gospels were being taught, false epistles were being written, and the new leaders like Timothy didn't seem to be near as strong as the retiring leaders like Paul. But Timothy was all Paul had. Keep the gospel safe. Guard what has been entrusted to you. Don't be ashamed. Let's close this this morning. Today, the church of Jesus Christ is facing equally perilous times. This is not a good time, not a good age for the church. Christianity more and more is despised. Christians are perceived to be low-educated, primitive sorts of people. The state is more and more against the church. The standards of the world have come into the church and the church is reflecting more the standards of the world than the standards of God through the word of God. The church is weakening. The church is more concerned that people have a good meal, better clothes and a warm house than they are about escaping hell and make heaven their eternal home. Basic Christian, Christian morality is being abandoned. Marriage is in decline. Sex outside of marriage has become normal. Homosexuality is an equal alternative to heterosexual marriage, marriage in many respects and in many churches. Basic Christian doctrines are being ignored. The deity of Christ is spurned. The virgin birth is rejected as a myth. Eternal life is a figment of imagination. The only life you have is what you can have here. Somebody said, get all you can, can all you get, and set on the lid. Creation has been replaced by evolution. The Bible is no longer our rule for living. Belief in God has been replaced by belief in man, which we call humanism, to believe that man is supreme, that man is all there is, and you make your own rules, and there is no power in heaven that has the right to tell you how you should live. We need to guard the gospel the way Timothy was commissioned to guard the gospel. We have been entrusted with the gospel the way it had been entrusted to Timothy. So Paul's message to Timothy is a message to the church today. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others also. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, exhort, encourage with great patience and careful doctrine. 
for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Somebody say amen. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Oh, church, we need Second Timothy today. We are facing perilous times. We must be strong. We must not allow the world to squeeze us into its mold, but we must be transformed by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. We are called to be world changers, not just to be like the world. For Christians, there is another drummer beating another drum beat. And we hear the beating of this drum. And we march to that drum. If no one else hears, we hear. If no one else follows, we follow. Because he is our Lord. And he gives us our instruction. So we are going to be studying the book of Second Timothy. I'm going to ask you to do something this coming week. I'm going to ask you to read the entire book of 2 Timothy at one setting. In my Bible, that's just one, two, three, three and one-third pages. You can probably read it in ten minutes. We too often read just bits and pieces of the Bible, and we don't get the story the continuity of what's happened. So if you will, sometime this week go into a quiet place, a private place, and read the book of Second Timothy. And I want you to try to imagine what Timothy, a 35-year-old young man, must have felt as he was receiving this last will and testament from his mentor, the fellow he's traveled with for 15 years. As we conclude, I want to tell you a personal story. I have to say if I could do this. But in 2020, my brother Joe died. And the circumstances were that to to a considerable extent, he was in charge of the times. And so he called me. My last conversation with my brother, telling me how much he loved me, that he was looking forward to spending 10 more years working together, but that wasn't going to happen. Then he gave me all the instructions, the way my older brother is, of the things I was to do. And I know how I felt when I received that phone call. From that experience, I can imagine how Timothy felt when he received this letter. I want you to feel something like that when you read 2 Timothy. One fellow said, no, nobody can read 2 Timothy without a mist forming on their eyes. Paul's last written word. Let's pray. Father God, we want to be faithful we want to guard the gospel. We want to be true to our calling. Father, as we study Paul's words to Second Timothy, may they be Paul's words to us. And yea, Jesus' words to us. Be faithful unto death. Father, we don't know what 2021 is going to offer us politically. 
We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what's going to happen with COVID-19. But Father, we know that we want to be faithful. And we pray that you would make us strong. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, let's stand and sing together, I surrender all. next week uh, the donation is going to be taken up and so if, if you can bring your, bring yourself and, and donate and contribute that and then hear the Lord's word but we'll close in prayer dear Lord we thank you for this day and we we surrender ourselves to you and your will that it be done in everything we do and we ask that you be with those who are struggling and going through strife Lord that you lift them up give them peace and comfort we ask that you continue to bless us as we open our hearts, hear your word, and share your will in everything we do. And may we be encouraged, Lord, to inspire someone to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.